Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Good evening. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Lindsay Davis Stover. We have a great show this evening. Joining us this evening is Sean Gibson, the executive director of the Josh Gibson Foundation and the great grandson of one of the greatest baseball players ever, Josh Gibson. Sean, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate you guys having me. Well, tell us the story of Josh Gibson, the man and the player. Yeah, so when you talk about Josh Gibson, um, as you mentioned, I'm the great grandson of Josh Gibson, and I run the Josh Gibson Foundation here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And when you talk about Josh Gibson, you're talking about a guy that was a phenomenal baseball player and a phenomenal man. And we can start with the baseball player side first. Uh, we all know Josh was one of the greatest, not African-American baseball players, but one of the greatest baseball players ever to play the game. Um, you know, Josh never had a chance to play in the majors. You know, he never had a chance to play in the major because of a man named Kennesaw Landis who decided to segregate baseball and did not African-Americans an opportunity to play baseball. And so he never had a chance to play in the majors, but he played for the Negro Leagues, which was founded by a guy named Rube Foster. Uh, this is actually the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. This was founded back in February 13th, 1920. And so here we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of these great men and great athletes. And so when you talk about Josh Gibson, the baseball player, he played for the two of the greatest teams right here in Pittsburgh, the Homestead Grays and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And, you know, he won four World Series. And, you know, Josh, we all know his home run greatness. He's known for hitting the ball to Yankee Stadium. He's known for hitting the ball to Forest Field. He's known for hitting the ball all over the place. But the one thing that people don't know is the man that he was off the diamond and he was a great man off the diamond as well. He had two kids that he raised on his own. His wife, dad, giving childbirth to the twins. Uh, and the twins were named after the parents, Josh and Helen. So, you know, we talk about Josh Gibbs. You talk about a, not only a great baseball player, like I said before, a great, a great human being. Well, let's talk about the baseball player. And I want to talk more about the man that he was because he was an incredible man. Uh, but he is most known for being the incredible baseball player that he was. In fact, played catcher, arguably one of the toughest positions uh, on the field. And, you know, you often hear Babe Ruth was called the white Josh Gibson, right? And, and talk a little bit about that because, gosh, it's incredible. When you take a look at the number of home runs he hit, when you take a look at the amount of games he played at, at again, one of the toughest positions on the field, talk about the greatness of him as a player. Yeah, as you mentioned, number one, being a catcher. Um, for Josh Gibson's stats to be so great at that position, it just tells you the talent that he, the, the talent that he preserved and uh, he had to play in the baseball. And as you mentioned, um, hitting home runs out of different stadiums, but the one thing, you know, I would say about Josh Gibson is that he was never, he was just a great athlete. You know, he was also a great swimmer. He ran track. Uh, he just not just didn't play baseball. He loved all sports, but he really excelled in baseball. And <clears throat> excuse me, when you talk about the Negro Leagues, you know, people try to discredit some of their stats and try to downplay who they played against. And they played against their competition wasn't that great. They played against minor league ball clubs. But you got to look at this. The Negro League has some great talent. If you look at some of the players that came from the Negro League, okay, I'm going to name two of them, Willie Mays and Hank Aaron. Yeah. And they weren't even the best players at the time in the Negro League. So if you take Willie Mays and Hank Aaron alone, there are probably two of the most famous MLB baseball players right now today. And they were considered mediocre in the Negro Leagues. So that tells you the talent of the Negro League baseball players. Um, you know, we talk about the 1936, 1935, 36 Homestead Grays. They had five Hall of Famers on that team. I mean, I'm sorry, Pittsburgh Croppers, five Hall of Famers on that team. You're talking about Josh Gibson, Satchel Page, Cool Papa Bell, Oscar Charleston, and Judy Johnson. And so, you know, when you talk about some of the greatest teams, I don't consider 
our teams great in Negro leagues. I consider our teams great in baseball history, period. And so Josh had a lot to do with that. And the other point that you made was, as you mentioned, Josh Gibson being the black Bay roof. You know, you say, I, I consider Bay roof being the white Josh Gibson and his grandson, Brent Stevens is a great friend of mine. We joke about this all the time. But the one thing I always talk to historians about when they try to discredit Josh's stats, I say, well, Josh Gibson had to be somewhat of a great baseball player because he would not be compared to Babe Ruth. There's other players he could have been compared to, but they're comparing to one of the greatest white baseball players ever. And they're comparing that person to Josh Gibson. So that tells you enough right there. That's right. Great company, right? To be compared in, in one sentence to have Josh Gibson and, and Babe Ruth. Uh, that's just right. incredible. <laughs> well, talk about the 800 home runs. I, I've heard you mention in, on the award, it says almost 800. Is that right? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so on the plaque, so people always ask me about how many home runs did Josh Gibson have? How many did he hit? And I always go with 799. And the reason why I go with that, because when you read Josh Gibson's Hall of Fame plaque, it says Josh Gibson hit almost 800. So almost 800 is 799 to me. So he still has the record. Barry Bonds has a few more... <laughs> Has a few more to go, but um, you know, but Josh, you know, he played 17 years. He played in Puerto Rico, he played in Venezuela, he played in Cuba. I mean, these guys just love to play baseball. And, you know, as I said earlier, it wasn't their choice. Society made that choice for them. They would have loved to play in the majors. And not only that, though, they barnstormed against some of the major league ball clubs. Yeah. And they would beat them most of the time. You know, Satchel Page had his all-star team. And uh, Dizzy Dean had an all-star team, and they would play against the Major League Baseball players a lot. And majority of those times, the Negro League Baseball players came on top. So some of the American, some of the white American baseball players, they knew about the talent of the Negro League. They knew they had some great talent. It just had to take one person, and it was finally Branch Rickey, to make that happen, to make that cross that color barrier with Jackie Robinson. You talked about the barnstorming games. And those were incredible, right? Because they brought people together. And when we're in this moment right now where we all are pushing for equality and ensuring that so many things change in our country in terms of, of social justice, talk a little bit about how those games, how baseball in particular, has really brought people together for decades. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's an it's such a unique way to, to really build a bridge and form those bonds and push for equality. Yeah, you mentioned, um, if you look at some of the old Negro League photos of Comiskey Park or, or Forest Field or even um, Old Griffin Stadium, you will see several white fans in the audience. And so, you know, some of the white fans, they understood the great talent. I mean, back then the Senators were, they were terrible. And so when the Grays came to town, they drew more fans in the center and some of their fans were white. And so what's going on right now in society, it's a shame with the whole Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, we all know that a lot of African-American athletes are out there. And we saw back a few weeks ago when the NBA did their protests, you know, there was enough was enough. And some of the MLB players protest. And you got a white sport like hockey protesting. Um, so you get everybody coming involved in this. But right now it was just that when they are when they're, when you're an African American, you're an athlete, it seems like everybody loves you, right? But then as soon as you leave out that stadium or leave out that arena and you're driving home, you know, you're still a regular African American black man or woman, and anything can happen at any given moment. You could the same person that could be cheering you on could be the same person that can take your life away. Mm -hmm. And it's a, and it's a shame. And so, but what baseball and other great sports do, it brings everybody together for that two hours, three hours collectively. Everybody's cheering for that same team, everybody's cheering for that same person or persons, and everybody's having a great time. So I wish sports can be 24-7, 365 days a week. Well said. Well said. And, you know, I would say athletes, professional athletes right now have set, done an incredible job to, in a way, lead many of these protests and bring the attention to the 
the injustices that that our country has. And and I think, you know, a, a responsibility that I feel like in many ways they have met and and that's been incredible. But you're right, we still have so much more <laughs> do and and I want to get to the integration of baseball in 1947 Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball can you talk about the difficulty of integrating baseball and and what many of these players had to go through just to be able to play ball <coughs> excuse me yes um you know what Jackie Robinson did is phenomenal um I think people don't realize the the weight he had on his shoulders to be able to be some successful in baseball. Um, the one thing I always talk about was, you know, yes, was Jackie the best out of the Negro leagues? No, he probably was not the best talented baseball player, uh, but what Jackie had, he had the military background. He had the UCLA education. And when Branch Rickey looked at taking an athlete, he wanted someone that was well-rounded that could be able to maybe, you know, upstand the, the criticism, the racism, and be smart enough to be able to hold back. And with that military background, he felt that he was one of those guys who would not just go out there on a rampage and, you know, when somebody was calling him the N-word or racist slurs, that he would just go off the chain and do something that was dramatic and end his career. And so what people don't understand that Jackie Robinson was carrying, you know, 10 million, millions and millions and 10 millions of African-Americans on his shoulders. And so it was kind of a bittersweet moment. People talk about when it comes to Jackie Robinson and Negro Leagues, because here we got uh, a, finally a first time African-American baseball players playing the majors. But then also <coughs> it's taken away from the Negro Leagues mm. because all of the fans were going to cheer for Jackie and he needed that support. And 50, 1950, is usually when the Negro Leagues finally folded. Now, there was teams still playing after that, but all the other great players, because you remember after Jackie left, then it was Larry Doby who went second. And that's the crazy part about nobody talks about Larry Doby, you know, Um, and he was the second player and then so on and so on. And so, but the one thing I will say this, and I want the viewers to make this and and, and try to think about this. If Jackie would have failed in 1947, okay, Who knows how long it would have took for another white owner to take a chance on a black baseball player. It could have set us back another 10 years. And like you said, 1947 was not that long ago. Not that long ago. It could have been 1957. And that would have been crazy. Um, So, you know, all credit to Jackie. He deserved everything that he gets. Believe me, he deserved it. And not just that, though. Jackie was a great civil rights leader as well. When he got done with baseball, he just said he used his athletic talent and he used his stardom as you can say to get out there on the front lines and protest he was out there with dr king he was out there with jesse jackson he was out there in the front line you know a lot of these athletes talk about it but are you really about doing that change and he was the one not only did he talk about it but he stood up for civil rights and so you know jackie you know hey he he carried us and he led the way well and and stood on the shoulders of so many like your great grandfather too and, yes. and I think that's what's incredible about it. Now, I want to talk about something that your foundation is really pushing for, and it's renaming the MVP award in baseball. Can you talk about the significance of renaming this award and really the importance of it, especially as we meet that moment that we're in right now here in our country? Yeah, the significant number one would be phenomenal if we can get the MVP award named after Josh Gibson. And 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 just to give you a quick story about it, and, and people can go and read the story on our website, which is joshgibson.org, as well as sign the petition. But as you mentioned, I was reading an AP article back in June or July, and you know, everything going on in America right now behind the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement. There's been several monuments, several statues that has been dealt with racism that have been removed. And Barry Larkin and a few other MVP players, former MVP players, had mentioned and thought about that, you know, uh, Kenneth Landis's name should be removed from the MVP trophy due to 
him denying African-Americans an opportunity to play Major League Baseball. And so as I'm reading the article, I see the three names they are considering. And one name was, of course, Branch Rickey. We know his story. The other name was Frank Robinson. Uh, for y'all who don't know who Frank Robinson is, he was the first black manager, as well as the only player to win the MVP in both divisions. And then there's Josh Gibson. And be announced to me, I'm like, whoa, Josh Gibson, I knew nothing about this. And so, you know, I went back into my board of directors and said, hey, look, we just found ourselves in a race um, that we didn't know we was going to be even in the race. So let's try to win the race. And we reached out to Rob Manfred at MLB, the commissioner. And he got right back to us and said, um, we don't decide that award. Baseball Writers Association does. And you need to call or contact the guy named Jack O'Connell. Reached out to Jack O'Connell twice, no response. And, you know, like I said, luckily, I do have the last name Gibson, which carries a little bit of weight. <laughs> and I reached out to some friends at ESPN and they loved the idea and they put us in touch with the undefeated. And as they say, the rest is history. So and for the viewers, if you're if you're listening, you have a chance to read it. The story is based on kind of a redemption, poetic justice. Um, so it's kind of where it is, is that. Kennesaw Land is denying not only Josh Gibson, but other great Negro League baseball players an opportunity to play in the majors. How ironic would it be for someone who he denied replace his name on an MVP trophy? So that's our story behind that. But, it, it, you know, like I said, for us, it's, it's a great way to get Josh's name out there on a national level. And we're excited about being in the race and hopefully we can win it. Absolutely. And tell us about this race. When will a decision be made and what does the timeline on that look like? Yep. So I don't know the actual decision when it'll be made, but the last time I've heard is that the Baseball Writers Association meets twice a year. They usually meet during the All-Star break, which was this past July, which we know there was no All-Star game this year. And the next one is scheduled for December during the baseball winter meetings in Dallas. Now, whether if they do an in-person or a virtual meeting, uh, from what I was told or what I've been hearing is they'll have some kind of discussion about renaming the MVP. I don't know at that time if there'll be a vote or not. Uh, but, you know, with COVID going on, who knows what's going to happen, if they even want to do anything at all. Uh, but I'm hoping they do have something virtual and it's up for discussion. But hopefully sometime in December, we should know a little bit more about it. So the earliest they could make this decision is December of this year. So all of our viewers watching our program this evening or online, please go to the Josh Gibson Foundation website. Take a look at the story. And if you're so compelled, please sign the petition because this is such an incredible change that quite honestly needs to be made. And, you know, I think as we talk about the, you know, social justice issues and the importance of the moment in our, in our country and ensuring that, you know, we all fight for equality, that we ensure that every person in our country is, is assured e equality. This is a really important step to take because as you said, and, and here in Virginia, uh, you know, we have renamed several high schools because it's important to meet this moment. One here in Fairfax was just named after former Congressman John Lewis. And it's important uh, to honor the service and sacrifices of, of those great leaders. And so please go to the Josh Gibson Foundation website, learn more about the story and sign the petition. Uh, December is, is the earliest time a decision can be made. So there's lots of time for you to gather friends and neighbors and encourage them to also sign the petition. And Sean, I want to talk a little bit about the activism right now. We've made a commitment on this show to talk about the importance of voting from now until November, because it is literally one of the most important things that we can do at this time. And so can you talk about how important voting is to you and what you're doing to encourage family members and neighbors and, and those that you come in contact to exercise their right to vote? Yes, I mean, voting is very important to me and my family. Um, 
as as we say, you know, my grandfather Josh Gibson Jr. Josh Gibson never had an opportunity to vote, and you know, several African Americans. I have friends today who still don't think it's um, mean anything to vote. They feel like their vote doesn't count, and I'm like, all votes count, you know, whether if your party won or not. I mean, there was a time when African Americans could even vote. So as an African American, you should go out and exercise your right and vote. And you know. I've been preaching this a lot with our young people here in Pittsburgh. I mean, there's a lot of protesting going on, not just here in Pittsburgh, across the United States. And for people that are listening who are protesting, all the protesting is great. Peaceful protesting is wonderful. It's great. But bring that same energy to voting polls. You know, you have all these protesters out there protesting, you know, bring that same energy in November. If you can bring that same energy in November, you can make a difference. And we're encouraging people to vote. Um, you know, we're here talking about the Negro Leagues. We're talking about the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. A hundred years ago, African Americans were not voting. And so you got to realize that, you know, take your vote. It counts. I hate when people say, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Everything matters. If it didn't matter, people wouldn't be voting. <laughs> Evidently, it matters. So exercise your right. Go out and vote. And, you know, here in Pittsburgh, you know, well, not just Pittsburgh, our state is an important state, Pennsylvania. And so we're definitely encouraging people. I mean, they're making it easy for you now. You get ballots, you can mail your ballot in, you know I mean? You don't have to go to the voting pools. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just a simple one step, two step, three step, put it in the mailbox and send your vote off. So I encourage everyone to get out there and vote in December and exercise your rights. And those of our viewers that don't live in a battleground state, but want to help in places like Pennsylvania, there are so many things that you can do. You can sign up to write postcards, to mail into battleground states. You can make phone calls. It is so important. Um, I think Michelle Obama said our, our life depends on it. And, and that that is so incredibly correct right now because in so many ways, our lives depend on it. So. There are too many people who have sacrificed so that we have the right to vote. So we encourage all of you watching this evening, not only to get to the polls and vote, but make sure that your family members, your neighbors, um, people that you connect with online, everyone gets out to vote this November. And you spoke a little bit about how your great grandfather never had the opportunity to vote. And, and we talked a little bit about the beginning of the show, the man that Josh Gibson was. And we all know he was one of the greatest baseball players. Can you talk about what a great man he was off the baseball field? Yeah, phenomenal man. And as we're talking about the MVP, you know, you want a, you want a well-rounded person that's a great person on the field as well as off the field. And Josh Gibson was, was a great person. Um, like I said, I had an opportunity to meet several former Negro League baseball players. Um, one of the big shows we did was right there in Virginia, at Chantilly, Virginia. They had a big, huge autograph signing there. Several in, in Negro League baseball players will be there, MLB baseball players, NFL players. And that was the first time I was probably uh, about 18, 19 years old traveling my grandfather, Jr. That's the first time I heard another Negro League baseball player uh, said I resembled Josh Gibson, my grandfather. And since then, a lot of people tell me that now. But just hearing their stories about Josh, uh, very competitive, um, you know, didn't embarrass a player, didn't show a player up, but very competitive, one to win, you know, great guy off the field, uh, liked to have a little bit of fun. You know, uh, there's, there's stories about Josh being a heavy drinker and things like that. He was a social drinker. Uh, just like everybody else, just like some of the white baseball players were social drinkers, um, but a great guy. And the one story I like to tell people is that, you know, Josh Gibson's wife died giving birth to their twins. And at that time, um, he wanted actually the doctor to save his wife and let the twins go, but it was already too late. So here you're talking about an 18-year-old kid turned into a man very fast and raising twins, um, trying to play baseball where he's getting death threats and, and, and the KKK is around. And so he never um, he never gave up and he wanted his kids to be uh, safe. So he left his kids with her family, which is Octave and Becky, who raised the twins while he was still playing baseball. And the other thing is that my grandfather, Josh Gibson Jr., had the opportunity to travel 
with my grandfather. So during the summer, he would travel as a bad boy. And he had a lot of great stories, uh, good and bad. And some of the great stories was just hanging out with his father and seeing some of the players. And I think he really enjoyed uh, his father being a big star. You know, he didn't uh, he didn't, couldn't understand how everybody just loved his father and wanted to see his father. But then he also told me about some of the sad stories where they came in counter with the KKK. Um, they couldn't go in certain hotels. Um, they couldn't go to certain gas stations. You know, they were they were pulled over by the police several times for no reason. And, you know, he so, he you know, for a young man at that age of 14, 15 years old, he went through a lot and saw a lot at a very young age. Uh, you know, up north, it wasn't as bad as, as it is down south. So he was really and at one time he told me his father was going to send him home because he thought it was too dangerous. But he wanted to stay. So those are just some of the stories of how Josh Gibson was off the diamond. Well, I'd love to hear your story when you realized what a great baseball player, great athlete your grandfather was. When did you first realize the greatness that your great grandfather embodied? Yeah, well, I heard it a lot ever since I was growing up as a kid because you have the family reunions and the family gatherings. And like I said, they called him Big Josh. You always say, well, Big Josh this, Big Josh that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Big Josh. Okay. And so I'm never forget this. I'm 13 years old in the school library and a buddy of mine pulls out a Josh Gibson book. Mm -hmm. At that time, you know, you know, you're 13, 12, 13 years old. You never imagine having a book about your grandfather or great grandfather. So I remember getting the book out, taking it home, talking to my mother and talking to my grandfather, Junior, about it. And you know, I see when I really realized I was 13 years old, I really realized that I had a famous grandfather and it was Josh Gibson. That's incredible. Incredible. What a great, not only famous, but what a great uh, baseball player and man Josh Gibson was. And we are going to continue to talk about the life and the legacy of Josh Gibson and talk more about what the Josh Gibson Foundation does. And again, I urge all of our viewers to go to the Josh Gibson Foundation website and sign the petition to change the name of the MVP award in Major League Baseball. Please stay with us. We have more to come. We'll be right back. When I was your age, I was just like you, fascinated by stars. But now I get to search for life in the universe. And who knows, maybe life is looking for us too. So we're like aliens to them? Yeah. Does anyone want to be a scientist now? I do. Awesome. We need more girls in STEM. Maybe we can find aliens. America, land of the free. It's at the core of who we are. Freedom. The freedom to live without fear, to drive through all 50 states, to sleep safely in our own beds, the freedom to jog where we please, to watch birds in the park, to wear a hoodie, the freedom to breathe. Before we celebrate the freedom most Americans have, we must fight for the freedom all Americans deserve. Because no matter your religion, gender, disability, age, race, all lives can't matter until black lives matter. Helping. What a nice young man. Pass it on. My goodness. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. I better get out of here. Ooh. Let me tell you about the toughest guy on earth. He does the work of two jobs. 
but only gets paid for one. He's tough enough to feed the man who gave him a lifetime of nourishment. <clears throat> he has the crazy strength to lift the man that raised him up without even flinching. That's right. No employee of the month bonus check here. This guy, no, this warrior, will always be by his father's side, even if his dad will hardly remember. Good luck finding a gym to train for that. If this guy isn't the toughest guy on the planet, then I don't know who is. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Even though there is so much against us, you will see me wearing a face covering. And even with my face covered, you will see me. As a son. As a friend to everyone I meet. As a fighter for change. As a woman who stands up for what I believe in. So join me in wearing a face covering. To help stop the spread of the coronavirus. Because this is one small act of kindness that has the power to bring us all together. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Good evening. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. We're continuing our discussion this evening with Sean Gibson, who's the executive director of the Josh Gibson Foundation, also the great-grandson of Josh Gibson. Sean, thanks again for being with us tonight. Yep, that's good. Let's continue the conversation. Well, when we left off, we were talking about the petition that you're working on to rename the MVP award and talking about what an important time it is right now. And as the story goes, what poetic justice it would be to rename this award. Can you talk a little bit about that with the backdrop of what's going on in our country right now, the activism, the marching, the you know just sense of urgency for a quality that's been denied for far too long. Can you talk a little bit about the significance of, of changing the name of this award with the backdrop of that going on in our country right now? As you mentioned, uh, there's, a, there's been a campaign on behalf of the Josh Gibson Foundation to um, rename the uh, Kennesaw, Landis, Kennesaw Mountain Landis um, National League and American League MVP Award after uh, Josh Gibson. And as you mentioned, um, you know, with everything going on in America right now with the Black Lives Matters movement, um, you know, there's been a lot of things that has been dealt with racism over the past 100 years or so. And one of the things is that, you know, we've seen the monuments going down and we've seen statues being taken away and we've seen certain other things being removed. And, you know, some of the former MLB players that are former MVP winners had decided that maybe it's a time to rename the MVP award. Uh, for, for the viewers who don't know, but Kennesaw Mountain Landis denied African-Americans the opportunity to play baseball. So, you know, we thought it'd be a great opportunity for us to be involved and see if Josh Gibson can be the name to replace that. As you mentioned, um, our article is on our website through the Undefeated. And our article is really based on, as you mentioned, a poetic justice redemption type of a story, whereas, you know, how ironic would it be for Josh Gibson to replace the same person who denied not only himself, but other great Negro League baseball players an opportunity to play in the majors. And we also feel as though if Josh would have the opportunity to play in the majors, he would have won several MVP awards. So that's our story behind the whole movement. So please visit our website, read the article. If you like what you read with the article, sign a petition. And I know we discussed in the last segment a decision could be made as early as December. So I urge all of our viewers that are watching this evening, please go to their website. 
this decision could possibly be just a few months away. And it's important that you sign the petition and that your voice is heard. And, you know, I think what's so incredible, uh, and we've talked again in the last segment about the person that Josh Gibson was on and, and off the field. And, and you told us an incredible story how he was a single father of, of two kids. And while, you know, everyone knows the legends and the incredible stories and what happened on the baseball field, as I mentioned before, it just telling my father that I was gonna talk to you tonight just lit him up because you say the name Josh Gibson and it really impacts people. And I wanna read something from the Major League uh, Baseball website. And I know this story, it's one of the stories that you know well, um, but it's something that I think just captures the magic uh, in terms of, of Josh Gibson. It says, one day during the 1930s, the Pittsburgh Crawfords were playing at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, where their young catcher, Josh Gibson, hit the ball so high and so far that no one saw it come down. After scanning the sky carefully for a few minutes, the umpire deliberated and ruled it a home run. The next day, the Crawfords were playing in Philadelphia when suddenly a ball dropped out of the heavens and was caught by a startled center fielder on the opposing club. The umpire made the only possible ruling he could. Pointing to Gibson, he shouted, you're out, yesterday in Pittsburgh. <laughs> That's the magic that Josh yeah. Gibson encompasses. And, and two, talk a little bit about the baseball player that he was, because I think the magic that he has and the way he you know, still mentioning his name, people's faces light up. I mean, the fact that he hit a home run out of Yankee Stadium. Talk a little bit about that magic for us. Yeah, you know, as you mentioned, um, how you said your father's face lit up when you mentioned Josh Gibson's name. And, that, and, that's, and that's what I like to hear because when you talk about these Negro League baseball players, um, you know, people, they were great baseball players. And it's great to hear that how people light up when they still mention those names. And like you said, Josh has been dead over 70 years. And people still talk about Josh Gibson like today's stars. And not just Josh, but the other great Negro League baseball players. But, you know, re listening to your story, and, and, that's the, and that's the great thing about the Negro Leagues, because you hear these stories of Josh Gibson hitting a home run out of Yankee Stadium and hitting a home run in Forest Field. The next day they're playing at Philadelphia and the ball comes off the sky. I mean, that just tell you how much talent and, and how great these guys were. I mean, there's a guy named Cool Papa Bell. And the story on Cool Papa Bell that he was so fast before he got in the bed under the sheets before the lights went out. So <laughs> <laughs> that just and I think when you hear those stories, we all know they're kind of mythical stories, but it just it just kind of can piece to their talent. You know, these stories just are not just made up based on it's not like cool Papa Bell was so slow. I mean, or so slow, he got in the, he, a turtle got in the bed before him. You know what I mean? They don't say those stories. It's the opposite way. <clears throat> and so when you talk about Josh Gibson, a baseball player, I mean, you know, like I said before, he's compared to Bay Ruth. So that, 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 that there tells you enough. But, you know, Josh was, like I said, the, the catcher playing the catching position. Um, you know, he hit for average. You know, his bat size was 40, was 40 uh, inches, 41 ounces. So he had a big bat. And so um, that's why he hit so many home runs. But, you know, I just want the listeners to know that please understand that these guys were great baseball players. No, they did not play in the majors. No, they played. Yes, they played in the Negro Leagues. But you can't discredit that their, 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 their stats. Um, again, like I were all like this whole topic has been that was Kennesaw Landis's choice. Believe me, Josh Gibson, Satchel Page and the other guys would have loved, loved to play in the majors against the white baseball players. But it was not their choice. And Kennesaw Landis is the guy who denied them. That's incredible. Uh, again, uh, for those of us that are joining late in the program, please go to the Josh Gibson Foundation website and take a look at the petition to change the MVP award. Sean, tell us a little bit about how Josh Gibson decided to play catcher because arguably it's one of the toughest positions, if not the toughest position on the field. How did he make that decision? You know, it wasn't really his decision. Um, he happened to go to a Pittsburgh Crawford game 
And at the time they were playing, one of the Crawford players got hurt, which happened to be the catcher. And the uh, manager and a few of the players knew about Josh Gibson from playing in the Sandlots. And they asked Josh to play in the game. And it just so happened um, it was a catching position. So it could have been a third baseman, outfielder, second baseman. He was just, just excited to play. And he went in and played catcher. And the story is he did so well at playing catcher. He, that was his position. So um, now he may have had some, you know, I'm pretty sure he probably played it during Sandlot, had some experience playing catcher. But I wouldn't say that's where he was probably his best position at the time. But he did well. And as the story goes, you know, he had a great career at a catching position, which we all know is, is the toughest position on the field. And not only he controls the game, you know, he controls the pitcher. He speeds, he he gets the plays, he gets the signals. Um, so that's a very tough job, you know. And like I said, not only his defense, he was a great catcher. And he, then he came up to bat and was doing great at the batting. That's great. I mean, that just speaks, that story in itself just speaks to his athleticism. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's incredible to be able to be, you know, considered one of the greatest baseball players of all time and just fall into a position like that. I mean, that's that's incredible. That's it says so much about his athletic ability. Now, talk to us a little bit about the Josh Gibson Foundation, because you all are doing some incredible, just impactful work uh, for youth and talk a little bit about what you do at the foundation and what your goals are. Yeah, so as you mentioned, we the Josh Gibson Foundation, of course, the name sake after Josh. Uh, we have three locations right here in the city of Pittsburgh. We're a partner of the Pittsburgh Public Schools. We have two locations in the schools, which is our STEAM program. Uh, and people are always asking, why do we have STEAM instead of STEM? Well, we added the arts piece because back in 2017, there was a world premier opera here in Pittsburgh called the Summer King after Josh Gibson. And I've never been to an opera, never even wanted to go to an opera, but I've learned a lot, um, you know, and it was a, for us, it was very exciting, number one, because you would never imagine, again, the same way when I talked about me finding out Josh Gibson was my great grandfather, how famous he was through a book. And to be able to have someone portray Josh Gibson in the opera world, in the opera life was phenomenal. And for it to be the first ever world premiere here in Pittsburgh in 80 years, and I always joke about it. I said, well, you know, Josh Gibson, he might have didn't break the color barrier in, in Major League Baseball, but he brought the color barrier in opera here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, so that's the arts piece. We work with the Pittsburgh Opera. But other programs we have, we have another site in the Hill District, which is called Ammon Recreation Center. Now, that is a historical site because behind the Recreation Center is the actual field that Josh Gibson played on, was Ammon Field. In 2008, we renamed it Josh Gibson Field. And so when the kids have an opportunity, you know, they're, they're playing on the same exact field that Josh Gibson and Satchel Page and Cool Papa Bell and some of the other great Negro League baseball players played on. And so for us to continue the legacy of his name through the foundation is phenomenal. I mean, we have a curriculum in the schools called BOSA. That stands for Business of Sports Academy. And what that does, it teaches the kids the business side of sports. You know, we try to tell kids, don't give up your dream of being an athlete, but there's so, so many opportunities behind the scenes. So our courses fall under sports media, sports marketing, sports law, sports sales, and sports events, where these kids can get a jumpstart on a career in sports. And it's a college credit course, and they also get um, up to 12 credits, so university. So, you know, we have a summer camp called Camp Challenge. Uh, we also do uh, a mentoring program at the other school locations. So, you know, we've just been able to be able to be blessed to carry on his legacy and reach so many youth. Um, we have several, Dewan, a guy named Dewan Blair, who played for the um, San Antonio Spurs, basketball player, came through our program. You know, we have several several guys that went to college and played baseball. So it's, it's and what I like about these guys come back, they give back, they come to the after-school program, they come to be a guest speakers, or they come to some of the athletic programs and help out with umpiring or coaching. So this has been a, it's been a, it's been a blessing to be able to carry Josh's name and uh, here in Pittsburgh through the foundation. Well, that's incredible. I mean, the work you're doing in the community and through education, I mean, it's so in incredible. And I know all the while also promoting baseball. 
And I want to talk to you a little bit about that because we've seen over the years the declining number of kids playing baseball, especially African-American kids. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because baseball is America's pastime. I mean, it has traditionally been a sport that everybody loves and does bring people together. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing to continue to promote the game? Yeah, before I get into what we're doing to promote the game, I just want to touch upon, the, like you said, the history. Um, you know, here we are right now in 2020. I think it's about 7 to 8% of African Americans playing baseball. And where at one time we weren't even allowed to play baseball. And then in the 70s, it was about 27%. And so, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's strange for me to talk to our kids about that because they can't believe the number. So the numbers are so low because they see a lot of the Latin players um, because they don't understand the difference between Latin Americans and African Americans. And we try to explain it to them. So, yes, they have the same skin tone as you do, but they're not considered African Americans. They're considered Latin American. So even here in Pittsburgh, you know, we've we've had a lot of Latin players. We have Josh Bell and we had one of the well-known players with Andrew McCutcheon at one time. And uh, he is no longer here with us. But, you know, when we talk about the uh, the game itself, um, you know, like I, I think I was talking about it before 1971 next year, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Pittsburgh Pirates all minority lineup. Now, Pittsburgh Pirates was the first team to have an all minority lineup. And it was a curious, it was consistent of Latin American as well as African American. And nobody would imagine that it would be Pittsburgh be the first ones to do that. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I think right now what we're trying to do get get more kids into baseball. It's, it's sometimes a little tough because, you know, some one we don't live in a warmer state, a warmer climate. You know, where we can play baseball year round. Two, you know, our Pittsburgh Pirates—they're not. You know, we're, our team struggles. Um, and this is a football town. I mean, you have an African American coach, you have African American athletes on that team who are superstars, and they're always competitive. They might not always go to the Super Bowl, but they're always competitive. They've always been competitive. And so our, our young people can tend to gravitate to football. And, and even with the parents, I see that a lot with parents, uh, especially single moms, they're in the football. You know, people think baseball is boring. But I try to tell our kids, I say, the thing about baseball, once you sign that contract, it's guaranteed money. You know, you're, you're good. So, you know, our goal is just right now is doing a lot of um, youth classics where we bring other teams from other cities in. That attraction because our kids get up playing other kids from especially from out of state. And so I think that's our attraction right now. Our attraction right now is just bringing nationally ranked teams into the city and for our youth to be able to play against nationally ranked players. So that's one of the, that's one of the ways we're trying to bring baseball back here in Pittsburgh. Oh, that's great. That's that's just wonderful to hear because it, it's tough to see those numbers declining. And, and you're right, I, I grew up in Texas and most people gravitate towards football in Texas. And uh, it's, it's something that we need to continue to do is encourage kids to play, to play ball because it's such a fun game. And it's something that families all across the country can enjoy doing together and can enjoy watching. So I, I love that you're, you're doing that. Now, traditionally, um, Major League Sports in particular, we've talked about, you know, Major League athletes who have stepped up during this moment and have protested and have led activism. Can you talk about just in general what sports have done to break down so many barriers and really bring people together? Because in so many ways, our Major League athletes are, are at the forefront of the Black Lives Matter movement right now. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, LeBron is one of them who stands out, who's really doing a lot. You know, you get some of these um, other African-American baseball players and you get some of it's, it's really the, the celebrities, um, the ones who are well known, like the LeBrons and the other great baseball players. But I think it starts back from back when Jackie Robinson was involved in civil rights. You had Jim Brown involved, Akreem Abdul-Jabbar, Muhammad Ali, um, Bill Russell, all those guys back in those days was leading the forefront. And I think that some of these guys are taking that, taking that torch. And, you know, I think that, as I mentioned before, all lives matter, but, you know, all lives are not getting essentially killed. It seems like just the black lives are getting essentially killed. And, you know, it was great to see the protest with the NBA a few weeks ago. Uh, some of the MLB 
uh, players protested. And the one thing that was really um, great is that when the NHL stood, stood up, which is, you know, we all know that's 90 percent white and 99 maybe percent white. But they stood up and which was great. And I think it's going to take a lot of those uh, high profile white athletes to get involved as well, uh, because, you know, we you know we expect the black ones to do it. But when the white guys or white athletes do it, it's a phenomenal thing because they're all working together and they, and they just get it. And, you know, so WNBA has done a lot. And, you know, I just feel like right now this time is with the Black Lives Matters movement. You know, we're talking about the 100 year anniversary of the Negro Leagues. And my grandfather, probably my great grandfather, probably rolling around his grave, never imagined that his grandson would be going through the same things that he went through 100 years ago. And so what I'm trying to do is educate our youth and through our program about Black Lives Matter. And I'm hoping that, you know, 100 years, it doesn't last another 100 years or my great, great grandkids are going through the same thing. And so we, we have to do something, but collectively we need everybody to come together. We need everybody to go out and vote in November. And we just need to take a stance. And hopefully um, this will end this senseless killings of African-American people. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned talking to young people, I, I assume through the work through the foundation. What are those conversations like for you? I, I can imagine how difficult they are. Can you talk a little bit about just connecting with young people on, on what's going on right now? Yeah, and as far as our organizations, um, you know, one of the things that we're doing is trying to get the police involved because we know we know all cops are not bad cops. And we know there's some great cops out there. And we want our kids to be more. We don't want our kids to be afraid of the police. The police is supposed to be protect and serve. And like I said, we had a we had one of our kids mention about she was scared to call the police because she didn't want the, her dad to get shot. You know, and that's the thing about it is like I don't want our kids to be afraid. And so we do have police intervention. We have them come in, uh, black cops, white cops, as well as female cops. And they come in and talk to the kids. And I think when you have neighborhood police and you want the kids to know the police that are protecting your neighborhood, you want the police to be able to be the kids be friendly and the vice versa. You shouldn't have to be worried about uh, here come the police get tensed up or, or go in the house or, or think something bad is going to happen. So those are some of the things that we're doing through our foundation is just really getting the police more involved in our community work and letting the kids know that there are great cops. You can still call on the cops when you need them. Don't be afraid of the cops. And so that's what we're trying to do right now. I think it's just, you know, uh, hearing so many stories from the kids, that was just troubling. Because these are these kids are eight, nine, or ten years old, and that, they should not feel that way uh, around police officers. No, it's just such a an example of stripping our children of their innocence far too early, right? And and it's it's so important that we do have these conversations with all of our children, so that as you said, you know, a hundred years from now, uh, your great great grandson, granddaughter right, are having different conversations. And, and I think that's what's really important. And these conversations are hard, but we have to have them with our kids. And as you mentioned, we have to vote in November. So I know early voting and, and many of the states that our viewers are in is starting this week. Uh, so vote early if you can, obviously have a plan to vote, uh, but do vote in November. I want to ask you, uh, as we wrap up the show tonight, what do you want people to remember about Josh Gibson? What do you want folks to remember in terms of his legacy? Because I would say the work you're doing at the foundation is only extending that. So tell us what you want people to remember about your great grandfather. You know, what I like people to take away from my conversation is basically that, you know, you know, look, don't look at Josh Gibson, a human being, first and foremost. Um, he was a God fearing man. He loved his family and he loved the game of baseball. Secondly, um, you know, there's a lot of stories about not just Josh, but Negro League baseball players. You know, do your research on these guys. I mean, these guys were great men off the field as well as on the field. And Josh Gibson and the rest of those guys, they love the game of baseball. You know, you know, you had to love the game of baseball. I mean, they didn't get to pay a lot of money. Um, you know, Josh and Satch were one of the lucky ones because they were the marquee players. And so they, they made a pretty good penny back then. But I like people just to know that, you know, again, as I keep saying it, this was not their choice. They loved the game of baseball. They would have definitely played and loved to play in the majors. 
And as I talked about before, these guys played against the Major League Baseball players several times and competed very well and sometimes beat the Major League Baseball players on barnstorming. So it was just a time, you know, some people say Josh Gibson was born too soon. Uh, we don't look at it that way. He was born at a time that just happened to be. But I think the one thing that we're doing is making sure that people, young people, as well as all races and creed, do not forget Josh Gibson because of um, what he has done. I mean, Josh Gibson um, was just a great player. And like I said, you know, it will be a great honor to have him on that MVP award. And we would hopefully we'll be talking to you again, Lindsay, another few months and, and next year to celebrate this. But, you know, all in all, not just Josh, but all the other great Negro League players just just really realizes that that was not your choice. And these are great men who love the game of baseball. Oh, that's fantastic. And remind our viewers again about your website and your social media so that our viewers can follow you on social media and also sign the petition on your website. Yep, so you can go to our website, which is just joshgibson.org. The undefeated article is on there. Please read that so you get a better understanding of why we're trying to rename the MVP after Josh. The petition is on there. There's no set of, there's no set amount of uh, signatures we're looking for. There's no people to sign it. If you if you if you if Josh keeps a fan or a New League fan or if you like the story that I wrote, uh, just sign the petition to support it. Um, our Twitter is Josh Gibson underscore nineteen eleven. Our Instagram and Facebook is just both Josh Gibson Foundation. So you can find us both there on social media. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Sean, for being with us this evening. It has been such a treat to talk to you and to learn more about the incredible man on and off the field that Josh Gibson was. And it's so important, the work that you're doing in your foundation and ensuring that you give young people opportunities, many of which your great grandfather didn't have. And you're inspiring kids every day. And you're also, you know, rising to the moment right now. And it is, it is unfortunate that we're even having uh, to have a discussion about renaming uh, the MVP award because it shouldn't be named after Landis given uh, all that he did uh, to stop the integration of baseball. So thank you for what you're doing. It's important work. Please go to the Josh Gibson Foundation website, sign the petition. And as Sean reminded us all tonight, the importance of voting in November, continue the activism in the streets and continue the activism at the polls. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Sean, thank you again. It was such a treat uh, to spend this time with you. And I do hope that you come back in a few months and we can have a show to celebrate the renaming of the MVP award. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Good night.